paranormal investigation has become more well known and somewhat accepted over the past few decades. However, that acceptance would not have been possible without the pioneers of paranormal investigation, Ed and Lorraine Warren. Ed had started experiencing the supernatural from a very young age, being that he grew up in a haunted home as he had claimed. While Lorraine was a clairvoyant and started experiencing the supernatural when she was between the ages of seven to nine years old. The two had married in 1945 and eventually would begin their paranormal investigations. They have been ridiculed and criticized, even called frauds. They still continued on with their investigations because they believed in helping people. This didn't stop Hollywood from using some of Ed and Lorraine's work for movies such as The Amityville Horror, Annabelle, along with the rest of the Conjuring franchise. It was the end of an era, as some have said, when Ed and Lorraine passed away, but their legacy lives on. And it was thanks to them that paranormal investigation is what it is today. Today, we will go over the lives and work of Ed and Lorraine Warren. May they forever rest in the sweetest peace. Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, hi my name is Monica. I like to post anti-MLM, so multi-level marketing, some life and true crime content here on this channel. So if any of that interests you, make sure to hit that subscribe button. I would love for you to stick around. In today's video, I do have to issue a disclaimer. This is all allegedly, this is based on just the information that I was able to find online. I do always encourage everyone to do their own research, especially with this because this does deal with the paranormal and I know that there's a lot of skeptics out there so of course everything is allegedly but i did want to give a quick shout out to a little girl named juliana because she her mom sent me pictures of them watching my last spooktober video she said that she wanted to watch another spooky video by me and so i thought that was so precious so juliana thank you so much for being one of the youngest fans of <laughs> my channel. But with that said, today we are going to talk about Ed and Lorraine Warren, which I very briefly spoke about in my Annabelle video. In this video, I want to go over not just their lives, but a few more very well-known cases that they were investigators on. So I do think this is going to be a long video. So make sure that you get some thing to drink, whether it be coffee, tea, maybe grab some snacks or something. But also just FYI, thank you so much to Sarah for becoming a channel member. It's so greatly appreciated. And as usual, thank you to everyone who watches me for free. Some of the basics that I'm going to go over about Ed and Lorraine might be a little bit of a repeat from my Annabelle video, but in case you didn't watch it or in case you couldn't watch it, because I had plenty of people tell me that they couldn't watch it due to it being about a doll. So I'm, it, th this might be a little bit of a repeat for some people, so I do apologize for those. But Ed Warren was born on September 7th of 1926 in Bridgeport, Connecticut. You may know him as part of the Warren duo, but Ed had supernatural experiences of his own long before he met his wife Lorraine. Ed grew up in what he believed to be a haunted house. The reasoning behind this is because he would hear the closet door open. After it opened, he saw some kind of a light and then eventually that light would turn into an older woman. There was an interview that I watched of Ed talking about how his brother didn't like to stay in the house. The reasoning behind that was because he too experienced what Ed had experienced with the door opening and the light and everything like that. When Ed told his father about this, now remember, he was a lot younger, he was a child. When he told his father about this old woman that he's been seeing, his father told him that there is a logical explanation for everything. But what Tony Spera, who is their son-in-law, said in an interview in the Travel Channel documentary called Devil's Road, which I highly recommend watching, Ed said that his father never gave him a logical reason as to why Ed was seeing this older woman. So his father said there's a logical reason behind it, but never gave him one. <laughs> According to Ed, when he was about eight years old, he heard about a priest performing some kind of an exorcism in the area. It was a local priest on someone who was allegedly 
possessed. Now we're going to move on to Lorraine. She was born on January 13th of 1927. I found conflicting information on the town that she was born in. Her obituary said Devon, Connecticut, but a lot of other articles said Bridgeport, Connecticut. Lorraine too had started experiencing supernatural things at a young age. I've seen and heard the ages to be between seven and nine years old when she started experiencing and seeing what she would originally call lights around people. This was before she knew that these lights were actually auras. Lorraine had thought that everyone could see these auras, so she didn't think anything of it. That was until something happened at school. Lorraine went to an all-girls school, which was also a Catholic all-girls school, and there were two nuns that, according to Tony Spera, it was Mother Superior and Sister Joseph. Lorraine had gone on to say that Sister Joseph had more lights around her than Mother Superior. It would later be found out that Lorraine was a clairvoyant. If you don't know what a clairvoyant is, so let's say you're very new to the paranormal or mediums, that kind of a thing, the Google definition is a person who claims to have a supernatural ability to perceive events in the future or beyond normal sensory contact. This is when Mother Superior told Lorraine not to speak of things like this. I wasn't allowed to speak of these things either. If you were new here, I was brought up Roman Catholic. I no longer practice. But it got to the point where I was even told celebrating Halloween kind of went against our religion, but my mom allowed my brother and I to celebrate Halloween anyway. So I totally understand how Lorraine must have felt in this situation. I understand that not all Roman Catholics are this strict, but from the church that I went to and the way that I was brought up, that that's how strict they were. Lorraine said that she joked about seeing these lights from then on out. She didn't say that it was real, but it was said that she never even told her parents. And as I stated in my Annabelle video, Lorraine never wanted to be different. She never wanted to be a clairvoyant or anything of that nature. She just wanted to be like everyone else. Then we fast forward to when Lorraine was about 16 years old. This is when she would meet Ed. Ed used to work at the local movie theater as an usher. And he said that Lorraine would come all the time to the movies with her mom. One day, Ed decided to ask Lorraine if he could walk her home. He would eventually take her out on a date. Both Ed and Lorraine were Roman Catholic. However, from what I've been reading and seeing, Lorraine was a little bit more devoted to her faith than Ed was. She was a little bit more, not necessarily extreme, but she was just the one that was very, very devoted to her faith. Of course, this would eventually turn into a lifelong marriage, but before we get to that part, there's a few more things to go over. Ed was 17 when he decided to join the United States Navy, and this was back during World War II. Him and Lorraine had been writing back and forth to each other while he was away. And it was said later on that most of their relationship in the beginning was through these letters. They didn't, they weren't really able to spend that much time together in person because of Ed going into the Navy at 17. That's when he signed up for it. During this time is when Ed would come face to face with the possibility of death. There was an oil tanker that had collided with the ship that Ed was on. This caused a fire. While he was swimming in the water, he found another sailor and he tried to help him as best as he could by kind of pulling him. I forget if it was Tony Sparrow that was telling the story that Ed said or if it was Ed himself, but Ed didn't even know where he was going. He was just trying to help and, and get away from the entire situation. But while he was swimming and pulling the sailor, all of a sudden they were surrounded by fire in the water. Somehow, thankfully, the Coast Guard showed up just in time, were able to help Ed and this other sailor survive. Shortly after this near-death experience, Ed was able to come back home to Lorraine. That's when they decided to get married in the year 1945. Lorraine was 18 and Ed was 19 at the time. 
Not too long after this, on July 6th of 1950, Lorraine would give birth to their daughter, Judy Warren. Ed found out about Judy's birth while he was in Nagoya, Japan. When Ed came back, he started painting landscapes along with houses, and then he would end up selling them. This would help them out financially. Ed and Lorraine decided to go to the Ocean Born Mary house. Ed went to talk to the owner about the home. Lorraine had some kind of experience while she was in the home. It's almost as if she went into a trance-like state and just stared off. Eventually she came back, but it was described that she had an outer body experience. There was an interview that I saw of her talking about this experience. She said that she wishes everyone can have that kind of experience because it was just beautiful and there was something about it that really truly just was amazing to her. Ed started looking for other haunted homes where he would decide to paint them along with adding ghosts into the painting. Lorraine would go on to give the owners of the homes these paintings of their haunted home. And that's how they would start talking to the homeowners about strange occurrences in the home. What Ed and Lorraine didn't know is this would be the start of something that just wasn't spoken at the time. Which is why it's no surprise that in 1952, the couple founded NESPER, which stands for New England Society for Psychic Research. This is the oldest ghost hunting group in New England. They had many different types of people that were on their team. Anyone from clergy to doctors, nurses, authorities, such as police officers, researchers, and even college students. After this haunted home painting thing kind of took off, the Warrens started getting phone calls from people who needed help with something supernatural happening in their lives or their homes. This truly launched their careers and they became known as the seekers of the supernatural. They would go on to eventually lecture at schools about the paranormal. But you have to remember that this is in the 1950s. This is not something that was talked about. And I'm sure a lot of people thought they were just making all of this up, that it was a hoax or that they were just possibly out of their minds. I mean, even nowadays, while paranormal investigations have become a little bit more well known and people are a little bit more accepting of it, there are skeptics out there who don't believe in it, who don't believe in the paranormal. That's the reason why I know a lot of you have asked me to speak on my own paranormal experiences, and I guess you can also classify some of them as unexplainable experiences, but there's a reason why I don't talk about them. First of all, some of them I am just kind of scared of talking about, unless if you know me very well, but I also don't want people to think that I'm some weirdo and that they still won't believe me even though I'm sitting here telling them because I don't have evidence of it. And a lot of people, when it comes to paranormal, if paranormal activity, if they're a skeptic, they need to see that evidence, whereas I don't really have that much evidence. I have some photos that I have, I have no idea where they are, but I have photos somewhere but a lot of people would probably try to debunk that there was just something faulty with the camera and that kind of a thing. I've even been told in the past that I was making up my experiences, which is why I started keeping them to myself. Something to keep in mind as we start talking about Ed and Lorraine's work and their investigations is that the couple didn't charge for their investigations. And I know that I kind of went over this in my Annabelle video, but they had only asked the people to cover their travel expenses, but that the investigation would be done for free. Anyone who worked with Lorraine and Ed or even just some of their, their clients, I guess you can call them, would say that Lorraine, it, it's when she would start to either communicate or when she saw something, it was almost as if you could tell that she saw something because something just changed about her. I mean, there was also some of the instances where she talked to these spirits, but th a lot of people would say that you could just tell because something was different about Lorraine. 
At one point, Lorraine even went to UCLA where there were some parapsychologists and they decided to do some kind of testing on her. Her test results would come back and show that she was a light trans medium. This was, it was, it was for her to prove to the public that this exists and that she does have this, this ability, but at the same time, it also kind of, it was validation that what she was seeing was in fact something supernatural, that this wasn't just her making these things up. It, it was just validation for, for Lorraine. Ed would state that he was a self-taught demonologist. During their investigations, the Warrens were trying to find priests that would agree to be part of their team because you need a priest in order to perform an exorcism or things of that nature. However, they would be met with a lot of back and forth with priests and, and things like that because some of them wanted no part of it due to not believing hauntings or spirits of, of these, these types of spirits, these bad spirits, which is something that, as, as I've already said, I experienced growing up as a Roman Catholic but after my Annabelle video, I did have a few people reach out to me and say that that wasn't their experience as a Catholic, so I'm going to assume that it probably dep depends on the priest. Now we're going to move on to some of Ed and Lorraine's most popular cases. Keep in mind though, these are going to be somewhat brief overviews and all of this is allegedly. I've already made a video on Annabelle as I've already said so many times in this video, so I'm not gonna go over that case. But the first case that we're going to discuss is The Conjuring House, which was the Perrin family in 1971. In January of 1971, Carolyn and Roger Perrin moved to a 200-acre farmhouse in Harrisville, Rhode Island with their five daughters. This farmhouse would become the inspiration for the movie The Conjuring. It was said that when the movie was being made, they had actually asked Lorraine to come on set to help get the most accurate depiction of what took place in the home. This farmhouse had 14 rooms, and of course, for a family of their size, this was perfect because they had five daughters, they had themselves. Not too long after they moved in, weird things started to happen. It wasn't anything major at first, it was just items would go missing or objects would be somehow in a different spot than they were left in. In all honesty, as someone who can be forgetful at times, I would think that maybe I just didn't remember correctly and that I had moved the object myself. Their neighbors would tell them to leave the lights on at nighttime. Carolyn would randomly find piles of dirt in her freshly cleaned kitchen on, on the kitchen floor, along with a lot of strange noises. Carolyn and Roger's daughters would start to tell them that there were some kind of spirits in the home, but that most of them weren't bad. Keyword, most of them, because there were some that were bad. This is when they started looking into the history of the house. What they did find is that the farmhouse was the home to the same family for eight generations. The creepy part, though, is that a lot of these family members died under mysterious or tragic circumstances. This is a little bit of a trigger warning because it has to do with the death of children, but some children had drowned, another one was murdered, and even a few hung themselves in the attic. There was a spirit that was not only in the movie The Conjuring, but supposedly existed in real life named Bathsheba Sherman, who lived in the farmhouse in the mid 1800s. This is a spirit that the Perrin family thought was the culprit of these really terrible experiences that they had in the home. There was talk that Bathsheba was a Satanist at one point during her life. Along with that, they had evidence that pointed to Bathsheba being possibly involved in a child's death from a neighboring home. Other things would happen in the home, like the smell of rotting flesh, beds levitating, 
just eerie feelings that they were being watched or that there was something else amongst them. Ed and Lorraine had been to this house a few times and they would eventually decide to hold a seance because of course exorcisms have to be performed by a priest. During this seance, Carolyn became possessed and started speaking in tongues along with being lifted in her chair. Roger, of course, was freaking out over the appearance of his wife. He just wanted to help her because, I, I mean, I can't imagine seeing my spouse or my loved one being possessed by something. But Ed told Roger that he couldn't do anything because any small interruption could possibly cause this possession to go south really fast. Roger didn't like the response from Ed and that was when he decided to kick them out, but before kicking Ed and Lorraine Warren out of his home, he allegedly punched Ed in the face. The Perrin family would live here for another 10 years because unfortunately, due to some kind of financial issues, they could not afford to sell the house. In 1980, they would move. The next case that we will go over is the Amityville house and the Lutz family in 1976. I'm sure everyone has either heard of or watched the Amityville Horror, whether you watch the originals or the remakes. I'm sure a lot of people who are watching this video have probably watched that one. The Amityville House was a beautiful Dutch colonial home that used to have the address of 112 Ocean Avenue and now has 108 Ocean Avenue in Amityville, Long Island, New York. Little did anyone know, but on November 13th of 1974, a man by the name of Ronald DeFeo, who was 23 years old, would go into Harry's bar and say that his parents had been shot and killed. Of course, the police were notified. Officers would find six bodies that had been shot and killed. This included Ronald's father and mother, who was Ronald Sr. and Louise, along with four of the five DeFeo children, 18-year-old Don, 13-year-old Allison, 12-year-old Mark, and nine-year-old John Matthew. They were all shot in the back of the head. Obviously, Ronald was the fifth child who was still alive and survived this. He denied having any involvement in the murders until investigators found a gun case for a 35 caliber rifle in his room. That's when he confessed and would be sentenced to six consecutive life sentences with an insanity plea due to him claiming he had heard voices telling him to kill. While some believe that there were spirits in the home, of course, you're always going to have skeptics. And those skeptics looked into Ronald DeFeo a little bit, which is when they found out that he grew up in an abusive home and his troubled childhood brought him to abuse substances when he was older. So of course, a lot of people thought that these voices that Ronald had allegedly heard was just his substance abuse talking. In December of 1975, George and Kathy Lutz moved into the Amityville home after paying $80,000 for it. That new home that a family gets cozy in would not last very long. George and Kathy Lutz told the press that they moved out after just 28 days because they claimed the house was haunted. They literally left everything in the home. The fridge was still stocked with food, Certain dishes and stuff were still all over the house. A reporter who heard about the story arranged to have an interview between the Lutz family and the Warrens. The Lutz family told the Warrens that they would start to hear strange sounds, voices, strange lights, shaking beds, some kind of slime oozing out of the walls, and they couldn't get to their children whenever their children were in trouble or if they were screaming out of fear. They just were never able to get to their children. So this investigation was one that the Warrens would say in the future they could never forget. The Amityville house is the one where you see the infamous photo of the ghost boy, so the light eyes and the little boy on the staircase. Some have said that this could have easily been one of the Lutz children. Others believe it is a spirit that was caught on camera. 
When Lorraine started to walk around the home, she did have a religious relic on her. She was holding it. She had stopped on the landing of the home, which almost hit her like a pile of bricks. There was something dark and inhuman there is what she would go on to say. Lorraine was so physically affected by this energy or this spirit that she got nauseous and just so sick. It was almost as if Lorraine was reliving the DeFeo family murders. That's why she just felt so sick and nauseous. According to Judy, who, as I said earlier, is Ed and Lorraine's daughter, she would go on to say that her mother said this particular moment in time is the closest to hell that she'd ever want to go. While they were in the Amityville home, Ed was holding a crucifix and asked for the spirit to show itself. After this, Ed was thrown to the ground. The Warrens came back to the home approximately two weeks later. This time around, they decided to hold a seance, and they did have a reporter by the name of Laura DiDio here for this seance. Unfortunately, they didn't make any kind of contact with the other side. While Hollywood will over-exaggerate and always have something happen during seances, whatever else that they do in these, in these movies, in real life, these unexplainable occurrences don't happen like they do in the movies and they don't happen as often as they do in the movies. Even though they didn't make contact with the other side, the cameraman tried to go upstairs the same spot where Lorraine was on the landing of the home where she got very physically ill. That's where he started to feel sick as well. Ed and Lorraine said that the priest or the exorcist had to come bless the house. Unfortunately, that never happened, and the Lutz family let the bank foreclose on the house in 1977 while they moved to California. After the Amityville house is... That's really when Ed and Lorraine's careers were skyrocketing, because even though their names didn't pop up in the book or the movie, people did find out who the investigators or some of the investigators were on this case, and they were Ed and Lorraine Warren. But if you're a little bit of a skeptic, eventually one of the Lutz children would go on to say, well, yes, the hauntings happened. A lot of these scary things and experiences did, did go on. George, which is George Lutz, he kind of over-exaggerated the stories a little bit. This could have been because he was somewhat a believer of the paranormal or that it was financially motivated. The reason why it could have been financially motivated is this was to sell a, a ghost story to the media and capitalize off of it to help with alleged debt that the Lutz family had. Of course, Ronald DeFeo's attorney said that these hauntings, these ghost stories were just that. They were just stories and they were all a hoax. The next case that we're going to move on to is the Smurl family and the year is 1986. As I said, the year is 1986. We are located during this time in West Pittston, Pennsylvania. Jack and Janet Smurl had called the Warrens to help them with their hauntings. The Smurls claimed that between the years of 1974 to 1987, they had dealt with ghosts. However, it got worse in 1986 when the Smurls were forced to move out of their home in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania due to some kind of water damage from a flood and into their West Pittston home on Chase Street. This home on Chase Street was somewhat of a fixer upper, and it wasn't until they started to work on the home that some strange things started to happen. Tools would go missing, old stains on the walls would seep through the fresh paint, and along with some appliances catching on fire, they claimed that the home was haunted by a demon. There were loud noises along with foul smells. The demon allegedly threw their dog into the wall along with throwing their daughter down the stairs. Apparently, another daughter had a ceiling light fall on her that caused her to get injured. She was okay, but she did get injured. This demon was allegedly trigger warning sexually assaulting family members. 
Jack and Janet even experience being in bed and levitating. The Warrens would say that this is a succubus, which is a demon that attacks someone sexually. This is due to being an insult to the birth cycle of Jesus is how they explained it. And I believe it was the Travel Channel documentary about them. Ed was thrown by this demon as well. They came to the conclusion that the house was being haunted by a harmless older woman, a younger and quite possibly violent little girl, and a man who suffered and died in the home. Then there was the demon who was using these three spirits in order to torment this poor family. Ed and Lorraine went to the Catholic Church and said that they needed help with an exorcism of the home. The couple was turned away and this is when Ed decided that he was going to use the media to their advantage. After this, I guess you can kind of call it a press conference, it was really them just on the porch of the small family home with a couple of reporters. But after this aired, and this was very widely talked about, the Vatican found out about this haunting, which is when they assigned someone to the exorcism of the home. Of course, as usual, there were some skeptics of this whole entire haunting. Professor Cutts of State University of New York said that the Warrens weren't being objective with this case. He thought that the Smarls were just having possible delusions or even maybe hallucinations. Jack Smurl would tell a reporter that in 1983, he had some kind of surgery to remove water from his brain. This was due to him experiencing some kind of short-term memory loss that was because he had meningitis when he was younger. There were claims that the home was blessed by several priests who didn't see any kind of harmful activity. Janet claimed that a priest had performed three unsuccessful exorcisms. And in 1986, a local priest spent two nights in the home and didn't experience anything that the Smurl family had told them about. That same year, the Smurls told the media that they were tired of constantly having to talk to the media and explain the whole entire thing. They were sick and tired of constantly just being I mean, I guess you could kind of say bombarded by these reporters asking them questions over and over and over again. So they told the media that they were just tired of having to do this. But after a few months, even though they were tired of talking about this, they wrote a book called The Haunted along with Ed and Lorraine and a Scranton newspaper writer. The book was criticized by quite a number of people, but the one that stuck out to me the most was another newspaper writer who said that the Scranton newspaper writer that helped with the book only showed a one-sided portion of the story and that the Scranton newspaper writer didn't do his job to investigate further. And that is the job of a writer. By 1987, the family experienced less hauntings and would move out of the house. In 1988, a woman by the name of Deborah Owens moved in and told the media that she didn't experience any kind of hauntings or anything bad that was happening in the home. Now we're going to move on to the haunting in Connecticut, the Snedeker family in 1986. You may have watched the haunting in Connecticut and while the Hollywood version of the story is slightly over exaggerated, which is why there's always a disclaimer in these movies that says, while this is based on true events, certain situations and characters are over dramatized for the sake of the movie because in order to make a good movie it has to be over the top and a little bit dramatic but even with that the warrens were called to this former funeral home alan and carmen snedeker along with their three sons their daughter and two nieces moved into this rental home in connecticut they would find a lot of items in the basement that showed that this was in fact a former funeral home. At the time of moving in, Carmen's oldest son was being treated for Hodgkin's disease. It started with one day when Carmen went to mop the floor. All of a sudden, the water 
in the mop bucket turned into a thick red substance. In an interview that I watched with for the travel channel documentary that they did on the Warrens, Carmen said that they had someone in the house at the time, I believe it was a housekeeper, that when Carmen had asked her about this, the housekeeper left almost immediately. Carmen's son told her that they have to leave the home because there's something evil in the home. There's a man with long, dark hair along with dark eyes and that the man knew the son's name. She thought that maybe his treatments were starting to cause him to hallucinate. Then her niece told her about how she was by herself in the home in one of the rooms when all of a sudden her shirt and bra strapped were being pulled down almost like they were trying to be taken off of of the niece of course carmen didn't think too much of it because not many people want to believe that their home is haunted or that they're being haunted by some kind of a spirit that's when carmen saw this for herself she was with her niece when she said that she felt something heavy, like some kind of dark energy almost. Carmen witnessed a hand going up her niece's shirt and at the same time, her crucifix that she had on her necklace just completely shattered. Ed and Lorraine would get a phone call from Carmen in the middle of the night. Of course, they went to investigate and Ed had suspected that there could have been some kind of necrophilia happening because it was a funeral home maybe that was a possibility then lorraine would go on to say that she felt some kind of demonic presence in the home a priest was called to bless the house however church officials decided on performing an exorcism instead because of how bad it was in the home and when it comes to an exorcism once you start one you can't stop it ed was being attacked during this exorcism and was taken away from the whole entire thing and into the living room hours after it was said that the exorcism worked but of course we have skeptics so what did the skeptics say some other things would pop up a little bit later on talking about how the son had allegedly had an issue with substances along with allegedly being diagnosed with schizophrenia apparently the upstairs neighbors said that they never experienced anything supernatural or anything like what this family had experienced ray garton who was the author for the book the haunting in connecticut not only did he say that the family didn't get their stories straight they were constantly changing the story but he would say that ed told him to ignore that and just make up some stuff exaggerate what happened to make the book a bestseller kind of a thing there was a tv show that got a little bit heated they had an episode where they had the family the warrens and some other people the family was being accused of lying about the whole situation and the reason why they were being accused of lying is because this was due to them quite possibly falling behind on rent some people had said something about how aggressive ed was being during the show but as someone who was raised in the northeast being a little bit more aggressive than the average person is kind of normal. I mean, for example, when when we say, hi, how are you? We're not actually asking for you to tell us how your day is. It's just uh, being polite and just saying, hey, how are you? The response is usually good, how are you? And it's left at that. So, I mean, I know that it's, I know that it's kind of terrible that we're like that, which is something that's been kind of weird for me to get used to here in the South, but it's normal for us to be a little bit more aggressive than the average person. While I will say that Ed did seem a little agitated in that interview, you have to put yourself in Ed and Lorraine's shoes. They were constantly being attacked and ridiculed and accused of fabricating their life's work it was constant they had skeptics all the time a lot of people didn't believe them while maybe some things were a little exaggerated this this could have happened but 
people were so quick to just go into a full-blown attack mode. There were plenty of other cases that Ed and Lorraine did investigate, which included the Enfield Poltergeist, Union Cemetery, Annabelle, which I already made a video on, Arnie Johnson, and more. Over their lifetime of their investigations, they had claimed that they had over 10,000 cases. In the 1990s, Ed and Lorraine were the most well-known and highly respected paranormal investigators in their field. Because Ed and Lorraine didn't want to turn people away, their cases were starting to pile up and they were starting to get way more than they could handle. That's when they decided that they wanted to start teaching other people how to investigate and how to help people. So that's when they opened up an education ghost school. Tony Spera, Ed, and Lorraine would go on to create a show called Seekers of the Supernatural, where Tony was the moderator of the show and he would allow Ed and Lorraine to talk about some of these investigations, some of their experiences, etc. In their lifetime, they even opened up their occult museum that was in the basement of their home in Monroe, Connecticut. With them having this museum, Lorraine did tell her daughter Judy to never look in Annabelle's eyes. Judy, still to this day, has not looked into Annabelle's eyes. In 2001, there was a documentary film company where they had asked Ed and Lorraine to come investigate this, this random tunnel. It was in Japan. While they were in Japan, Ed took Lorraine to Nagoya, Japan, and took her to the exact spot where he found out that Judy was born, which I thought that was just so sweet and just I'm sure that was a really, really emotional and beautiful moment. Not too long after they had come back from Japan, Ed had suffered a stroke which left him in a coma for 11 weeks. Once he had come out of this coma, it was said that he was never the same again. Lorraine would take care of Ed. Five years after his stroke on August 23rd of 2006, Ed had sadly passed away. Tony stepped in after Ed had passed away and him and Lorraine would continue on the Warren legacy. Tony has since been very active on their YouTube channel as well. I'll leave that in the description box if you'd like to go ahead and subscribe. As I said in my Annabelle video, Tony had stated at one point that he would sometimes come home to see Lorraine just super tired. When he would ask her what was wrong and why she was so tired, she would reply with she was up in the middle of the night because she got a phone call from someone asking for help and she didn't stop the conversation until she had helped the person. Lorraine would just be an amazing person and I've heard nothing but good things about Lorraine from just reading about her to knowing someone who met Lorraine but sadly on April 19th of 2019 at 92 years old Lorraine passed away. Some paranormal investigators said that when she passed it was the end of an era. Say what you will about Ed and Lorraine Warren, but I do believe that they helped people and they were pioneers of paranormal investigation. While some people might not believe these hauntings, if, if you're someone who, I don't know, let's say that you're experiencing something, even if you're fabricating it, even if your mind is playing tricks on you and these hauntings aren't really happening, Ed and Lorraine coming to help you kind of psychologically might just help you in some kind of a way. So that's something that I wanted to mention. Now we're going to go into some more skepticism and some of my final thoughts and opinions. There was an alleged affair between Ed and a young woman by the name of Penny. When Ed was in his 30s, he was a bus driver because not many people knew who he was. That's where he met at the time, 15 year old Penny. I won't go into this in detail because there have been lots of attorneys involved and I just don't feel comfortable speaking on this topic for multiple different reasons. So I'll let you guys look that up on your own. 
Another reason why is because in one article that I was reading, there was someone who came out and said that they wouldn't talk about this to the media if the studio that was working on the Conjuring franchise would settle. So you can form your own opinion on that. My opinion, I do think that Lorraine was doing all of this to truly help people. And while I do think Ed was very involved and believed in his work, at the same time, he was probably the one that was trying to capitalize off of all of this. He was probably the one that was trying to figure out ways that they could make money from this because they weren't charging for their investigations. I'm not saying that they only did it for the money because of course they made money through different types of sales rather than the investigations. So I'm not saying that they only did it for the money because I do respect Ed and Lorraine's work, but maybe, just maybe, Ed kind of took advantage of this just a little bit. But as I said in my Annabelle video, I do think because they made this into their life's work, they should get compensated for it. Unless if this was a hoax and unless if this is an entire scam, which I personally don't feel that way, but everyone is entitled to their own opinion on this because this is paranormal activity. This is something that there are a ton of skeptics out there about this topic. One thing that I didn't point out in my Annabelle video was people have said that while Ed and Lorraine didn't make money off of these investigations, they made a ton of money off of the books and anything that had to do with Ed and Lorraine Warren. While yes, they may have made money off of all of this, if you think about it, people didn't need those books. They wanted those books. Whereas people who were truly experiencing paranormal activity, they thought that they really needed help on that. I mean, I may be biased because I do believe in the paranormal. I do believe in other things being out there in this world, whether it be the, in this realm or another realm or spirits or whatever. I also respect Ed and Lorraine's work, especially Lorraine, because you can just tell that she really wanted to help people. A lot of people have said so many amazing things about Lorraine. So you guys can form your own opinion about all of this. Let me know what you think in the comment section below. I'm probably going to next week. I might be a little bit quiet on my channel because I am getting married next Saturday. So I might be a little quiet. I also will most likely spill my Spooktober true crime series into November because I don't know if I'm going to have enough time to get any other videos for you guys next week. But anyway, let me know what, you, what your thoughts are and thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys next time. And this is Monica reporting to you live from a highway. Bye.